Testing, testing. Can you hear me, Adam? Yep. Great. Okay, camera, sound, okay. So, hello uh, and welcome. My name is Jason Barker. Uh, I'm Associate Professor of English here at Kyung Hee University. I'm just getting some... Uh, some feedback here on my computer, just one second. So, uh, thank you. Hello and welcome. Thank you for being here today. Um, welcome to Kyung Hee University. Welcome to Manifestos for an International University. Uh, we are live on YouTube, uh, broadcasting the first of 13 weekly manifestos from the College of Foreign Language and Literature global campus, Kyung Hee University. You will find the schedule of speakers on our website, thisisnotauniversity.com, and web links to our YouTube channel, This Is Not A University. Uh, over the next three months, we will be hosting manifestos from Jiun Song, Esther Leslie, Alberto Toscano, Alex Takwang Lee, Reza Negarastani, Jungwon Park, Nadia Buali, Nina Power, Andreas Malm, Myung Ho Lee, Justin Clemens, Jian Kim, and in a few moments, AJ Bartlett. Please check our website if you haven't already for updates. Uh, I must thank a few people first. Um, uh, first, uh, Professor Kyung Hae Lee, uh, the Dean of the College of Foreign Language uh, and Literature of Kyung Hae University. Thank you for your generous support for this uh, event. Thank you for your confidence in me, um, in basically uh, allowing me to do whatever I liked. Um, thank you to the Center of Cross-Cultural Studies, uh, Min Sok Song, uh, for his technical support, Sung Jae Oh for his uh, technical support and organisational mastery, um, Todd McGowan, thank you, and Jeon Kim. Uh, we don't have an opening ceremony planned, contrary to uh, the information on our website, um, but um, I'd like to ask, if I may now, Professor Kyung Lee Lee, um, uh, the Dean of the College of Foreign Language and Literature, um, just to come and say a few words to formally open um, the symposium. Uh, dear friends and colleagues, as Dean of uh, the College of, of Foreign Language and Literature at Gyeonggi University, it gives me great uh, pleasure to open this uh, international symposium. I hope it can in inspire solidarity, cooperation, and above all, nourish 
between professors and students of Gyeonggi University and university workers from around the world. During the next three months, we are going to be joined by professors from Australia, Great Britain, Lebanon, Sweden, and the United States. We will hear manifestos that address the following questions. Where is the university going in the 21st century? How can it adapt to changing times? And what is the relationship between the, the university and education? Students and professors, I encourage you to engage in this discussion with an open mind. In education, let no question be of limit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll just add a few brief, a brief remarks without trying to explain anything, actually, about the symposium itself. Um, uh, we have been working here in the College of Foreign Language and Literature for one year now uh, in the strange and unprecedented, unprecedented situation of a university without students. Uh, almost none in the classroom. Uh, I'm sure some of our speakers are going to address this, uh, but when it comes to the relationship between education and the university, it does rather beg the question, what are we doing here? As students, as professors, as teachers, as learners, as researchers, as writers, as university workers, what is the social purpose, what is the intellectual purpose of an institution which wasn't exactly open to begin with, but which is now, all over the world, indefinitely closed to the public and to its own consumers? Manifestos for an international university will hopefully shed some light on this. Uh, and I hope it will do so in a way which is also, dare I say, decisive. Uh, this is not a talking shop. This is not an after-dinner conversation. Uh, the, question, the questions we are dealing with here uh, are questions of our own educational practice and our own educational experience. We have a right, dare I say, as university workers to decide what the university is for. So I encourage our audience uh, here and online uh, uh, to ask questions. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, please write your questions into the chat box uh, and I will relay them to uh, today's speaker. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure um, to introduce you to our first speaker. AJ Bartlett is General Secretary of Melbourne School of Continental Philosophy. He is the author of Badiou and Plato, An Education by Truths, and uh, Lacan de Leur's Badiou, uh, the, uh, the, um, the author, I should say, of Lacan de Leur's Badiou with Justin Clemens and John Roth. He is the editor with Justin Clemens of What is Education? He is also the editor and translator of essays by the French philosopher Alain Badiou, including Happiness and the Pornographic Age. Over to you, uh, AJ. Hi, thanks, Jason. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my paper is entitled uh, The Prestige of the Object. It is hard to love the university. 
The institution which owns the name has not walked but run to become little more than a cross between a hedge fund and a property developer, in so many ways a rent seeker. The knowledge which circulates in it and of it, which is sometimes the same, sometimes out of joint, is really not even a commodity in the economic sense because it mostly doesn't matter to anyone. And yet, at the same time, that this is the place of knowledge, as this knowledge tells us, is its residual selling point, its utility, the economy of its knowledge. And in that sense, it has everyone in its sights, but obviously not in the same way. Moreover, why should I be interested in an institution which overwhelmingly and throughout its entire history has meant nothing to the overwhelming mass of people? Indeed, it has either purposefully excluded the masses or has led the masses to believe that for reasons of intrinsic incapacity and unknowledge, it was off limits to them, which in turn has led inexorably, given the constitutive bind of an education to one's position vis-à-vis -vis the relations of production, to the reproduction of class relations. And with that, the specious, patronising self-belief of this class in their knowledge as the means of their superiority and value. That because they hold such knowledge, their class position is not only justified but legitimate, as is that of those who do not hold this same knowledge. It's a well-worked conceit. And even today, after that much vaunted democratisation of the university post the 80s, which is, of, which is, of course, as anti-democratic as all our democracies, still only about a third of people in the West, the only place whose knowledge matters, are. Credit points to Lacan for reminding us qualification is a highly, almost hilariously ambiguous term. Daddy, to paraphrase Freud, can't you see I'm being qualified? The university has always been a corporate interest in one form or another, and depending on the form of the state, the neoliberal turn being only a distinct iteration, and knowledge has been the key to its function or really its ideology. Thus, I would shift Althusser a little here. It doesn't teach ology per se, hidden or not, though it still does, but rather that it is the place of knowledge, is the ideological gambit, ultimately. Ideology plus point of sale equals knowledge economy. To wit, the rarely bothered with question of knowledge as such, given after all, the university knows. This level, level of imitatio is quite an achievement for something that likes to nominally situate itself as heir to the academy. So anyway, the idea of a manifesto for the university is absurd. It is already what it is, and essentially anyway, has been. And the double bind of this is that if, you're sent, if you centre your manifesto on some idea of its redemption, if we just peel back the state or capital from it, its idea will be shining forth, for example, or even in a more onto-theological register, that at the place of its great danger lies the saving power of its knowledge type thing, then you have merely signed on as another university marketing manager. There is little more insidious than piously harking back to a golden age of education, which mostly means a time when academia was quarantined from the ravages suffered by other workers, a time the pious, nostalgic, romantic, or hopelessly bereft like to call academic freedom. The prestige of the object trades on this knowledge of its imminent, separating and metaphysically redemptive power. It's always the potential we are never not waiting on, to put it in the classical register of Horatio's philosopher, whose curriculum, ironically, never stops arriving. That said, a division can be opened up within the university, which is not of it, but has and can come to be in it. As long as we remember what the university is at all times, a place and a placeholder, a site and its representation. That's to say, as a form of the form of the state, it is also the entity whose knowledge is a check on those truths that occasionally interrupt or erupt within it, that it can't do without. So I'm going to make new and old division in the university whose terms ultimately don't need the university at all and is, to borrow a term, subtractive of it. But just a characterisation, I'm going to initially anyway make use of some familiar phrasing, which I employ in the same way as in the original, 
to force us into the situation that we are in, to think not in terms of what was lost or what might have been, what might have been, but to address ourselves to a present that exists for the taking. A spectre is haunting the university, the spectre of education. In our epoch, all the powers of the capitalist state have entered into holy alliance to exercise the invariance of this spectre from within itself, while yet maintaining at the level of its nomination, the level of its representation, of its prestige as object, the generative power and subjective force of the invariant, such that we can say that for the state, education must appear, but it will not be. Where today is visible the truth of this invariance that hasn't been or isn't in the process of being snuffed out and decried in the name of all that is holy, all that is knowledge in the capitalist state. Every party of government in every state, which is to say every executive everywhere of the capitalist state of our situation, by sheer force of the logic served, the knowledge which orients its rule, must re-establish and maintain the division of the educational invariant from the variances of pedagogical utility. This division, critical to the reproductive function of the form of the state, must itself appear only in its pedagogical form. That's to say, the truth of this division between the educational invent and its representation as pedagogical utility must not be known. That the state knows as education all there is to know of what is education, of its knowledge, its transmission, its effect, is fundamental to the legitimacy of the state itself. Thus there is in the state, as constitutive of the state, the division which it disavows as true. And there is, as the knowledge of the state, the disavowal that any disavowal takes place. For this reason we can say that the state cannot educate. Hence, perhaps, the uses and abuses of the school and the university for life. Without the truth of this knowledge which it represents, there is only pedagogy, and pedagogy wedded as it must be to finitude, to what repeats, is simply the slavish transmission of the knowledge of the master to a select offspring, such that they will have successfully made their way in, and thus logically reproduced, this same form of the state over and again, infinitely. Or in other metaphysical terms, this form provides its ever-retreating horizon, the finite production of its infinite potential. Again, in other words, its unknowability is the limit of knowledge for the pedagogical form of the state. But this means, of course, that pedagogy, pedagogy needs what it represents as nothing. It needs what must not be, to be what appears as such. Let me hazard my operational definition of education. Education consists in establishing the effects of an encounter as a transformation. I insist on the invariance of this within all situations, no matter when or how constituted. When there is education, this is what it is. In this definition, which clearly situates education, should it not be impossible, as necessarily unbound from the pedagogy of the state, and so the forms of its reproduction, education is always what makes room for the new, the truly new as such, and not merely the variegated yet numeral iterations necessary to the pedagogical imitation and limitation. Education is that hardest thing, a renewed orientation to the situation as such, an unknowing of what we know as knowledge for the sake of knowledge truly. So not no knowledge, but knowledge in truth. What is of all? This is to say then, effectively and ultimately, education names the chance taken at something other than the form of the state itself, something we can, we'll call generic, true but unknown, universal and absolutely new, but without totalising the situation within which it works. Education marking the lack of reproduction is, we might say, a world to win. But first, to, first you need to unknow that such is not winnable, not easy, hazardous, often unwaged. The history of all hitherto existing education is the history of the struggle between the educational invariant and the pedagogical form of the state, or between what is education in truth and the pedagogical form of its knowledge, between the invariant and its appearance as a state form, or between that impossibility of which the subject of education is capable and the necessary incapacity of every subject as known to the state, and so on. 
Within the history of this struggle that long predates what we call the university, but turned always on this same antagonism, the university and the school generally came to be the site of this struggle at the heart of what came to be known as education. And so necessarily, because the relationship between truth and knowledge remains at the heart of it, the university inherited, duplicated and finessed both its central antagonism and the means of its representation and became thereby the legitimate site of its repetition. But what is the guarantee of the legitimacy of this knowledge as such? Is it the truths that are worked through there, produced in the educational procedure as defined above, establishing the effects of an encounter as a transformation? Or is it the knowledge of the state, which is anyway always the representation and reduction of whatever becomes true to the utility of the form of the state, whatever form that takes? Like the advances of science are to the predations of technology, for example, or egalitarian universalism is to our democracies. Which one is the university? The irony is that as the pedagogy of the state, the university is, albeit differently, both. That's to say that in order for it to function as it does and always has, albeit more or less antagonistically, as the site guaranteed by the state to give legitimacy to its knowledge of what can, but much more importantly, what must not be, the university must, as noted, presuppose the truth of education in order to represent it pedagogically. In this very pedagogy, crucial to it as a matter of what it transmits, and thus the importance of the form this transmission takes, is the disavowal of the real at the heart of this division and of this division itself. Hence the necessity of the reproduction of its disavowal, or the production in its subjects of lack. Pedagogy produces the subject as what truly comes to lack education. And this pedagogy remains always and necessarily three might three removes from the side of the true. Whereas education, which is not pedagogy, in being oriented only to what is true of it, anywhere, any place, any time, and not then subject to any form of the state, is never anything other than this process of encounter, invention, transmission, and effect. Education, if it exists, is what is invariant. It proceeds within any situation as inventive and transmissive and as such cannot be subject as education to any knowledge of the state, which it necessarily works through. Its orientation are ends are not of the state, even if and when the state is all there is for it. To be bound to the state would be to presume knowledge that escapes and thus conforms education itself. And of course, this knowledge that conforms, being operative upon it, would be off limits to education itself. It would be a knowledge of education that education cannot know. There's again this educational unbinding which any form of the state, its pedagogy, exists to prevent. At times in its history, the university, leaning on the invariant, has enacted as itself what it announced itself to be, the site of the universality of what can be thought. But this act is not down to the university as such. Indeed, it might be useful to consider here the founding of Bologna and Paris too in the following century, or at least what it was that drove them to be founded. In both cases, if relative to different immediate conditions, the driver was the collective desire of those who would be master and those who would be student for, simply, a place where education might take place. A place where education might take on the form of itself, of giving the greatest possibility, and yes, freedom, to establishing the effects of an encounter as a transformation, as perhaps a knowledge of itself as this, and of thereby formalising, relative to this encounter, the means and continuity of its transmission and effect. And crucially, as announced, for all comers, universality which is not a totality. At this level of foundation, we have no form of the state, even if, of course, the existing form of, that's of the state that unholy alliance between church and sovereign sought immediately to either forestall or to utilise in one way or another what struggled to be founded despite it. If we were interested to look for what some like to call the idea of the university, it might be situated there. The site in which a drive to knowledge might have been oriented by what is true of it and thereby invariant to it. Not the same course of truth for each situation or epoch, but that in each epoch a truth is taking its course, 
whatever that might be in the situation for that epoch. Truth's not truth, but truth every time. But let's note in passing how even this peculiar phrase, the idea of the university, is still used today. At best, as a placeholder for what is sensed or somehow vaguely experienced as be, being either out of joint in the university or absent from it, but which, when so used, resounds as stupidly as any of the university slogans used to brand their difference that are familiar to us today. Newman's idea, Cardinal Newman, which is the most often cited, which maybe riffs on but also probably disabuses the older Baconian claim, long forgotten anyway between a certain retro, beyond a certain retrograde rhetoric, was not ideal, shall we say, but already clearly and determinedly circumscribed by another ideal, which, clearly by dint of the very structure of the form of the utterance, was the ideal proper of which the, universe, of which the idea of the university was adjunct. That's to say, the university didn't, for Newman, generate its own idea, but could be regulated by one the idea of the ideal, you might say. It's instructive, this usage, because it does repeat the pedagogical form of the knowledge of the state, the state which can't think at the price of undoing itself, but always knows. It's because it is precisely beholden in its formal set out, this idea shackled to an ideal, to something that in itself is deemed unknowable, a god, the market, etc. The operating knowledge of which gives, sorry, the operating knowledge of which gives what we know as knowledge its form, the form of the state for which, of course, to live without idea is always the current curriculum for the subject of lack. And this unknowable, which is strangely knowable enough to be known as unknowable, something we must all come to know of it, in fact, is then the bind of all possibilities, or rather is the impassable of the impossible. And to import some more terminology, what is played out here is the division between the constructivist vision and the generic, between the globalising and the universalising, we might say, between what is to be known of all and what an all can come to know of itself. Pedagogically, the university is not on the side of the universal, but the global. But let's not skip over noting how central now it is to each university to brand its difference, even its exception as if it were generic. This is especially strange when you would suppose that in each university as a university, what is at stake is the very same thing, universally speaking, an education. And so we don't even need to note, do we, that each branding and every slogan announcing what is supposedly at stake in the university is, the university brand tells us, subject to the utility of its effect. That's to say, it advertises to you what you will have made of yourself subject to its tutelage under the contemporary form of the state. As Lacan noted, the state is that which knows what you will do. The university functions as its discourse and grades or degrades its subjects. This promised effect of a differential pedagogical utility is what makes one offering better than its rival. And of course, we are meant to understand that what each is offering better is education. But this only, or at least this should, one more effort if we are to become educators, beg the question of what sort of education this education can be if it is bound by the knowledge of its end, its end in the form of the knowledge of the state, of course, which is also the same as its beginning, of the state and for the state. The greatest brander is the greatest teacher of the form of the state, is what they are saying. And unbinding is not only impossible, but anathema, anti-intellectual, such is the capture and such is the virtue of the pedagogy of the state. No child left behind. This constructive correlation between orientation and end, the knowledge of the university, let's say, brings to mind how Protagoras, the preeminent and richest of all 5th century Athenian sophists, the constant antagonists of Plato and Socrates, branded himself in just this way, telling the youth, Hippocrates, who had travelled far, inquiring after this good master, that in exchange for his money, his game will be this. After each day with me, you will go home a better man, more ably adapted to the city, 
and the day before and so on ever after. Protagoras ostensibly made his youth job ready. But also, of course, this pedagogy you know, presupposes the good of the state itself, a good which will continue necessarily to be unthought and which anyway the sophists can't conceptually distinguish given his ontological convictions, let's say, from the best. This is for Plato the originary corruption of education, which is at the same time its only legitimate representation. It is the foundation of its norm. And, for, and of course, for corrupting this corruption by not teaching it to the youth and for not knowing its knowledge as true, Socrates was sent down. More often than not, the university operating, sorry, more often than not, the university in operating by the logic of this correlation between orientation and end has thus operated on itself as the guarantee for the state of what must not be thought, which we can call, if you like, the idea, the idea of the true, which an education can only be. But no, not the idea of the university, but of education itself, of which the university may or not be at some time or other the name. Certainly the idea, as noted, precedes it, is not determined by it and will outlast it, but for all that, it is not necessarily beyond it. The idea of education, which may or may not be the idea of the university, is also the name Plato reserves for the corruption of the corruption that sophistry establishes as normal. Hence again, the fate, as, any, as noted, of anyone who does not teach the knowledge of the state. But as we know today, the university has way more often than not entered the struggle on the side of pedagogical utility. And so as a form of the form of the state, extracting from the invariance of education, thus education in truth, the power of its idea, which it falsifies and corrupts for the sake of utility, and thus for a knowledge unknown to all. And the subjective collective freedom inherent to the idea of education as transformation, and education by truths, in other words, it reduces to an individual's capacity to make their way relative to the existing state of affairs. This representational and so falsifying procedure of the pedagogy of the state, the state is a pedagogue, can be simply stated in its negative form. The knowledge of the state is what cannot be thought. If we keep to this strong form of negation, antagonism, we can say affirmatively that what can be thought, if not as knowledge, is the truth of education. And finally, to say these both together, the state does not think. As a pedagogue, it necessarily must pass this lack onto its subjects as a necessary qualification. So pedagogy as the knowledge of what cannot be thought is the global credit point construction of subjective incapacity. This is what they call outcomes. In this guise, which is to say relative to this, its historical norm, the university functions, and we cannot say merely, as the site for the reproduction of the knowledge of the state. And further, given this knowledge is the end of the antagonism, the knowledge of the state produced in the university, is also the end of the knowledge of the antagonism integral and inherent to education itself. Which is to say then, that the university finally, as a form of the state, not only does not educate, but it is, is the historical site whereby in the name of knowledge itself, education will have not taken place. And this is because, of course, that all hitherto existing state powers, ever on the lookout for what it cannot affect, have recognised the power of education to not be what the form of the state determines it to be. That power, that invariant power of education, what it names as such, is in fact the void or hazard at the core of any state that no state can abide to be known. What is left over in the state determination of education is precisely what cannot be of the form of the state. Hence it teaches repetition at the level of its form, reproduction at the level of its knowledge. Because the chance encounter provides the orientation of any true education, which is what is not of the form of the state, the establishing of its facts as transformation means that the very knowledge of the state might come to nothing. We have to insist that there is no necessary relationship between education and the state, and so between education and any form of the form of the state. Whenever the university is a form of the state, it does not and cannot educate. The youth may learn there to be something in the state, but the youth learns thereby what that something must not be. The university exists to localise this invariance within it, so to ensure its impossibility universally. 
What it teaches, precisely, is the subjective incapacity at the heart of all knowledge of the state. In short, the university exists more now than ever. An intensification of this side of the antagonism has taken place over the course of the last half century or so. To make sure that whatever new knowledge is produced and new only if true and true only if it will have been the knowledge of all, will have existed only in a state form as the knowledge of the state. Whatever it is then must be sellable, profitable, or a utility of some sort or other to the state. Moral, familial, humanitarian, democratic, and so on. This is the only form in which new knowledge can be known. Otherwise, it is nothing. We know that the university is committed to the almost endless knowledgeable production of this nothing. While every discovery made known is profitable, thus is determined by the transcendence of the market, the determining, if not the true condition of our contemporary knowledge, is both the legitimacy of the university as the site of knowledge and the legitimacy of its knowledge as such. This knowledge is imposed pedagogically at all levels of the state, not just in the university or the school, but media, law, what passes as cultural production. But of course, in another, let's say, adjunct ruse, this imposition is itself what passes now as educational equality or universality. To put this in its proper representational form, everyone, it's compulsory, must be exposed to this pedagogy as the knowledge of all. Lest we encounter that something else that must not be. The virtue of this knowledge is then twofold, it expands globally and expands internally. The constant calls for more education here, there and everywhere, such that its subjects, everyone, everywhere, sorry, such that its subjects, everyone, everywhere, to the means of its subjectivization, such that, not coincidentally, equality, which is always a presupposition of education and necessarily a matter of truth, is universally impossible. The pedagogy abroad in the contemporary state, ably and expertly transmitted by and affected through the university as a form of the state, is incapacitating, stratifying and hegemonic. It knows what cannot be known, or if you like, what must not be true. Pedagogy and education are irreducible. Pedagogy produces as its knowledge globally the incapacity of all for education. In other words, under the pedagogy of the form of the state, education is lacking for all, whereas education marks the universal capacity of all for coming to know what is true of it. It is simply the thought of all that all can think. The university has always been the knowledge of the form of the state. There is only, we might say, knowledges and states, except that, and here is where what might be called my manifesto kicks in, there is education. My thesis, which is only developed more directly, maybe, and at the level of language anyway, more militantly in this direction, is that the university must be destroyed. But while I dream of bulldozers in the open air, my thesis is that the university must be destroyed by education. And this means both internally, so education from inside the university itself, and I mean also from outside the university. It's privilege as the site of the knowledge of the state, which has always been predicated on a radical exclusivity of the knowledge of those who never could or never wanted to set, in, to, to set foot inside one. My thesis of the university, or rather of the universal, which the university as a form of the globalising state is a check upon, is that the truths of the university and of those who never set foot inside it are the same. And thus it is at the level of these truths, another name for what I have been calling the educational invariant, that we need to speak of universality. If there is a university education, it has nothing to do with the pedagogy of the university. In order to finish but remaining with the thought of all, which after all is always the desire to finish with some state, let me remark on that other word that carries so much weight on the one hand of history, of status, of recognition, of desire, and yet is, and yet is relative to what it also names, traduced in every possible manner by exactly this representation. I'm speaking of, as I always have been, the academy. <clears throat> I have long wondered about what we can only call the fetishism of the name perhaps the, fet the commodity fetishism of it, which of course carries within it an attachment disavow as strong as any sexual drive. 
and indeed probably signifies for us a very close alliance between the knowledge of the state and perversion. But this fetishist disavowal in common is precisely what allows me to speak about the academy, the uses and abuses notwithstanding of Plato. I'm not going to retail what Plato meant by academy because he didn't mean anything by it at all. It was the name of the grove where they hung out, and that's it. It was named after a famous athlete, Academus. What matters is what in the name exceeds its place as the name of an education for all. So I've asserted at length the antagonism between education and pedagogy, between the truth of the form and the knowledge of the latter. I've associated pedagogy and knowledge with the form of knowledge of the state, and for good measure I threw in sophistry with the latter precisely because of its professed and professional capacity to make the youth better fitted to the form of the state, which, after all, is the logic of the masters. Academy is used interchangeably with the university, which belies, obviously, some historical come ideal association, probably down to Cicero, if we want a genealogy of contempt. It also perhaps it's all it is also perhaps the biggest ignoble lie told by the contemporary university about itself. But in telling the lie, associating itself to the academy, it does mark over again the origini originary antagonism I've talked about, Plato versus the sophists over education, and also the appropriation of that into itself as solved, and so the disavowal of both the antagonism and that it has been so appropriated. Indeed, this double movement is, of course, sophistry par excellence, as Plato well demonstrated. And again, the killing of Socrates, that single and singular corruptive figure in all of Athens, was this disavowal of the antagonism at the heart of education, and as such a warning in perpetuity as to its actual impossibility. So I don't want to belabor this anymore, but if you use the word academy today interchangeably with the university, and if you refer to yourself or your colleagues as academics, then necessarily you are invoking Plato, like it or not, hate him or not, as precursor, as in whose lineage you follow, or perhaps unfollow, or block as the case may be, more likely it's on mute, <coughs> sorry, but that's one irony among many, and this is especially so given that between the Platonic Academy and the dialogues of Plato there is no contradiction. <coughs> Let me note two things about our dear Plato in the contemporary field, both to do with what I came to see as Plato's contemporaneity. First, Plato has become the great figure of our distance from the question of truths and relatedly of justice. We are in fact all anti-Platonists now, even if we don't know it, precisely because our contemporary knowledge requires that truths are either off limits to us, a more transcendental approach, or are, in their so-called classical Platonic form, merely the rhetorical dictates of a particular authority, and so have un no universal status. At best, the word truth can only refer to a specificity enacted in one or other of the recognised modalities pertaining to an identity. It's the case that, that today our epoch vacillates between the transcendental and the relativist, perhaps the liberal arts and the humanists, to invoke an older argument. And I'd say that Aristotle, that curriculum par excellence, probably provides the metaphysical link but for Plato as for Stalin both are worse but despite this distance taking from truths and thus despite educating on the basis of the impossibility of such it's under the platonic injunction that our knowledge functions so long as we deploy this common term the academy we deploy and suppose the resonance for our educational institutions from Plato's own school it's not so much an irony as a necessity of pedagogy or sophistry. It's self-renewed relative to the history of this central antagonism. To interrogate the actuality of this resonance, which the reforming humanists skipped, a squip, a skipping they thus bequeathed, it suffices to recall that over the door of Plato's academy was inscribed, let no one enter here is not a geometer. This, we need to understand, was, practically speaking, an imperative. To attain to the truth of things, you need to know geometry, which at the time was advanced mathematics beyond mere arithmetic, whose concerns were for the demonstrably invariant truths its subject brought to knowledge. But more than this, or in fact as a necessary correlate of this, the inscription over the portico is an orientation to thought, and one Plato very pointedly connected to the political imperative of justice, 
which for him is the truth of politics, which also, note, requires that the subject be collective or in trajectory universal. Everyone has the capacity for truths, he says. One can again productively compare this to the differential brandings of the university, university similarly inscribed over their respective porticos. In the Gorgias, Callicles, Socrates' sophistic interlocutor recognises the consequences of this orientation, tells Socrates that if, he, that if he carries on with this geometrically conditioned idea of justice, the educational invariant, he will have the world turned upside down. <coughs> In my terms, we would have gone from the pedagogical norm, which knows what the all will do, to the education of all, which is the truth of what all are capable. From the algorithm of the global to the geometry of the universal. Only the latter in orientation, trajectory and transmission, it scribes itself in history as the academy. The critical importance of education, the reason ultimately for it always as invariant, being in contention, is that in every epoch it is situated at the juncture of knowledge and truth. If the knowledge of an epoch is such that it is predicated on the impossibility, however articulated, of truths, then it is the knowledge of the state that prevails in that epoch over education, regardless of what you might know. <clears throat> knowledge unshackled to truths is bereft and ultimately infinitely corruptible. It can only thereby be put into service, better or worse. And what it serves will necessarily be off limits to knowledge, as is the knowledge of the pedagogue to the reason of its master. The knowledge of the state is off limits to the subject of the university which reproduces it. Until you begin to determine the status of the knowledge of your epoch with regard to what is true of it, and thereby the place of your specific knowledge within this conjuncture, you haven't begun to be critical or academic. And this is the situation the university finds itself in today. It is so saturated in knowledge, so unshackled in orientation, transmission and aim from any concept of a true education, after all, what good really is an untrue education, that it has no idea of itself and it can't operate as anything other than the reproductive arm and armature of the variable knowledges of the capitalist form of the state. As I've said, education invariantly, when it exists, is what can never be the pedagogy of the state. The university must find this orientation or it will continue not to be. As was said of the Republic, which as the Academy as such, after all, set this whole thing off, it is nowhere visible, but not impossible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, AJ Bartlett, for that uh, very powerful intervention. Uh, I'm going to ask if there are any questions at this stage. If... Uh, would, would you mind coming up? Because we don't have a, a second microphone, uh, Yanis. Be careful when you of the lead, yeah? Thank you. I, I really appreciated that. Uh, quite a lot of things that I, I agree with. But since you brought some of the Greek heritage, and I'm Greek, I, I, I have to disagree on some other things. Um, I, I don't know, Jason, Jason didn't say if, if I, I assume you are a colleague, I assume you're a university professor as well, or you have been at some point. <clears throat> yeah, at some point. Good, because I am, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. I'm a little bit confused. I'm a little bit depressed. I'm a little bit, <laughs> frustrated, but I'm also very intrigued by your generalizing tendencies because you tend, you tend to leave out the specificities and the specific, by specificities I mean you, me, anyone who has taught in the holistic meaning of the word taught. All those of, of us and those who taught you and me and who have planted the seed of doubting, doubting the knowledge that has been given to us, uh, all those that, who have planted the seed of thinking for truths that are 
truths and remain truths. They are not somebody's truth. They are just truths that can be truths today. Some of them are going to be gone tomorrow, but also come back the, the day after. So what I'm trying to say here is this. What is the scope for the intervention of the people that have taught you and have kind of guided you in questioning the role of the university, questioning the, the, the um, genuine character of, of knowledge? What is the role or what is the scope for the intervention of people like me, people like most of the colleagues here who are trying to tell people Forget about learning these theories, because you're not going to remember them in four years. They're not going to serve them. They're not going to serve you anything. Just try how to think. Try how to identify instances where when somebody tells you something, what is the point behind that? I, I hope that makes sense. As I said, it's, it's more of a yeah, comment yeah. combined with a question, if you can identify the question. But I really appreciate the yeah. opportunity to to generate, to wake up my brain cells early in the morning. That was very interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks. <coughs> I, if I could, I could just say that I, I think what you... Man, this is bad. Um, what you articulated there, I don't think we would disagree on. So what I was trying to paint, I guess, was a more structural picture of this fundamental division that runs through the history of what we call education where there is an antagonism between what I was calling the knowledge of the state, for example, and what you're sort of pointing to, which is these points of intervention which make it possible for thought to emerge or arise, and upon which you can then, given that a thought is always, in some sense, a break with that knowledge and then possibly a reorientation to that knowledge itself in the very sense which both comes to understand what is said in terms of its content but in terms of the structural sort of um, framing that is given to that knowledge. So what you just said then really, well, the way I heard it, maybe this is a bit um, narcissistic, was sort of, um, I, I mean, I, I agree with that because obviously within every institution, um, there are people who are genuinely committed to the notion of education, which I'm trying to, I guess, hold on to in some sense. The university that itself as an institution, as a structure and so on, you know is much more culpable and complicit with the ongoing um, reduction of that to something which is almost impossible to do. So there is that distinction. I mean, there was a thing that Althusser once said about some teachers who were trying to, you know, abide by uh, a, a commitment to education and what's possible of it, you know, and they were sort of heroes of some sort. I mean, I don't want to generalise that either, but... That's, you know, there, there is a certain aspect of that. And I'm not saying this about the university to uh, say that everyone who works in the university is this horrible, complicit operator of the state. We're all sort of trapped within that situation and framework, obviously. But the question of how we think about education and don't think about it in that sort of totalising state form of discourse, whether we think about it as all good and great, which the state also already says and thinks and so on, its whole point of provision um, is based around that idea. Um, I just want to like flag that for me in the entire history of the discourses around education, and I think, I've argued anyway, this is very evident in, in what Plato recounts to us, there is a fundamental and structural division um, around these different orientations to the question of education and necessarily, you know, ideas of knowledge and truth and transmission and so on um, are, are critically part of that. So... You know, I would agree with you absolutely that the point is to set up the possibility, let's say, of an encounter of some sort, and that is an encounter with the very structure and transmission and form of knowledge that we're given as education, as well as with whatever the subject or topic might be. So I hope that sort of addresses what you, your comment. But yeah. Thank you. Uh, do we have any anyone else who would like to respond or ask a question, comment? If you do, you'll have to come up here. I'm sorry, we don't have a we don't have a roving microphone, which would probably make it a, little, a bit easier. Um, I've noticed that we do actually have some online some questions from our online um, 
audience, if you're ready for this, uh, Adam. Yeah. Can I um, have the right to refuse? No, you have no right to refuse. Uh, All right. Fair enough. So we have a question from ja ja Janye, Yan Janye B, who says, don't the problems you talk about of university education start from preschool and primary education? That is where reproduction of knowledge starts. And um, also continuing, in this case, if we destroy university education in its present form, surely you would have to destroy primary and secondary education as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe we should step back from the rhetoric, the rhetoric of destroy at least, at least in its you know most ex extreme version. I know I did say something like that, but what I mean is, you know, that that sort of reorientation to the question of education as something other than that, you know, reproductive form that we're all very familiar and used to is the key to that destruction, if you like, right? It's an affirmative procedure which basically comes to uh, organise the situation rather than has to just destroy things and leave, you know, and, and begin again, right? It's not what I'm saying. We are already in a situation. It's already constituted in the way it is. It's already possible in some senses to get a handle or, or, or get an idea of what that situation is. And it's possible on the basis of, precisely th a thought and intervention and encounter to begin again to construct and reconstruct on and through and maybe even with in some regards what we already have some other way of thinking about this doing this um, accounting for it giving it giving it a sense of its own purpose its own idea and so on so there is some accuracy obviously to what you say I mean the whole point of compulsory education particularly from the very youngest years, which everyone is, you know, pretty much universally keen on, which is something we should always interrogate anyway. If there's a mass consensus on something, it's probably have, worth having a look at. But, I mean, this itself began in an antagonism. Um, there, it was struggled and fought for, both for and against, by different political groupings, by different um, sections of the, of, of uh, well, uh, from different class positions. When compulsory education became a thing in schools in the late 19th century in the UK, for example, it came about in a very sort of complicated and unexpected sort of way. Many of the union organised union groups, the Chartists and others, were absolutely against the education of their children by the state because precisely of what they rightly understood the state wanted to do in terms of that. And many of those um, let's, who were sort of tasked by the uh, British government at the time to establish this, were keen to do so for the reasons that the Chartists, for example, pointed out, to get hold of those working class children and to train them in the good values and morals of a market-based um, uh, economic state, basically. They explicitly said this. That was their intention. That was their role. That was the key of compulsory school schooling for young people. And that's the sort of premise, at least, which the English system of compulsory education based itself. And so there was an antagonism at the very start of that as well. What I'm sort of arguing is that antagonism returns and is a constant. And if we just think that education is good without thinking about what it is, how it begins, how it's, you know, the, the forms of its transmission, what it serves, is it simply a utility and all that sort of stuff, then we're just going to be... Um, stuck in this sort of consensual relationship to it. Right? One of the great things that education has, well, that the state has done in terms of education, as I've tried to sort of say, is that it's taken on the inherent virtue of it, you know, as a good, and then perpetrated that as its rationale for what it delivers to us as education. Right? It's not all bad in the schools or in the universities and so on, no. But the orientation to it that has been given to us as such is itself problematic and needs investigating lest we just consent without thought. So I guess that's my answer to that. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one more question here. Um, 
uh, Ki Wan Song is asking, uh, what are your suggestions to resist uh, this, uh, this unprecedented attack on education by the state, which, meant, which mainly delivers corporate values, while universities uh, pay lip service to, quote-unquote, good education? Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's the burning, I guess, question. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I could offer any suggestion uh, you know, specific suggestion. Everyone sort of has a good sense and idea of what it is that is um, being addressed to them, being perpetrated upon them, um, that you have to suffer in order to continue to do the job that you want to do, that you might be committed to, that you might in fact love. So it's quite straightforward in the sense that we know what is um happening we know the processes and we know i guess the structural determinations that drive that we're all pretty much aware of that what to do about the university is the question of what to do about um the our, our political configuration more generally right there's no way you can intervene on the university and make it the ideal which most of us who you know work or have worked in these places imagine it to be because it's not it's not um, differentiated from, it's not separable from um, the way our states run these days, right? Parliamentary democracies, capitalism, whatever you want to call it, um, is in the driver's seat and you can't change the university unless you change that. So, that's all I can say, really. Yeah, but I mean, just maybe if I could come back on that, I suppose there is still... Um I mean, if you come back to this question of, of education and a, com and a comprehensive education, I suppose there is still that question of whether something like a more, uh, a more general education, a, a kind of education which serves people, um, could operate without the university. Or what is, the, is there a kind of relative autonomy that you're suggesting between the university as that kind of, you know, superstructure of intellectuality and just a, something like a general education well i mean as you as as you know there are like many sort of um various schools and of, of many various types trying to operate at some sort of distance i guess from that um state framework um i mean just you know the questions about the university and the way the university operates is it's pretty impossible for it to um, absent itself from that these days and in fact you know there's probably no one in management in the universities that even has any possible thought that it could be any other possible way i mean that's not what they've been trained or educated to understand and that's the other thing i mean we should it's worth bringing up is that you know it's not a lack of education right and this is my point Every manager, every VC, every, you know, every sort of, well, almost everybody who works in the university in the administrative area, everyone who works in government, everyone who's a policymaker, everyone who works at, you know, every investment bank, they've all had the best education money can buy. And literally speaking, they've, they've you know, they've spent the most money to attain this thing. So, you know, they don't lack an education if you like. So what's the possibility for education if that's what the, what the model of education is? And that also, of course, is the education that provides you with a, a livelihood, which will get you the job, which will make you employable, which will fit you into the economy as it is. I mean, these are all the questions. Is it possible to establish some form of education which is not beholden to that orientation? There are always attempts at this. I mean, because it's not like it's a, you know, what I'm, I think I'm, what I'm relating here is pretty clearly not a surprise to anybody maybe the articulation i want to give between truth and knowledge as a sort of philosophical underpinning of that antagonism might be different i don't know <clears throat> but you know what can you do if you want to establish yourself on the basis of an education which is not in any way in, in you know adhering to the state form whether it's in terms of outcomes or terms of um, in terms of uh, money or in terms of status or any of those sorts of things. 
they're experiments and they exist and they some continue and that but they are absolutely limited because at every point at some point they're going to hit up against the same structural issues and the same structural problems that uh the university has taken on as its own sort of remit these days so I, you know those things are important they must continue and even inside the university as your first question pointed out these things must be made to continue to exist and if they can be transmitted to a cohort to another group of people who can continue to make sure that that orientation to education or to knowledge itself exists then that is something it's not nothing right but in order for something to challenge the status of the university as the place of knowledge you know again that's a large question in terms of how you might articulate a process whereby that could be changed but also I don't know it could happen at any point in any way I mean today is the anniversary of the commune after all I mean, you know was it a month and a half eight weeks ten weeks or something like that the people of Paris were able to change and absolutely uh, revivify their own orientation to their city and they did all sorts of things really quite quickly in, including um, opened up education to everybody and many people painters artists poets etc stepped into those places and became educators in that situation in common on the basis of what you know the people themselves demanded it to be <clears throat> and that came essentially you know i guess out of nowhere unexpectedly and so on yes obviously they were massacred and sent into exile but nevertheless you know it happened it can happen again Yeah, thanks. Please. <laughs> Hello. Uh, uh, thank you for beginning the first uh, manifesto for this event. I am the one of the later speakers in this event. So when I, I mean, listen to your presentation, I am a um, uh, English major and I teach English in the Department of Global uh, Communication. Uh, when you, I mean, um, use the platonic division between um, pedagogy and education and the antagonism between uh, knowledge and truth, uh, as an English major and who have some faith in humanities to agree with you. And uh, based on that antagonism, how can we change the current university system? I do agree with you. But I would like to start with more existential uh, situation in which I am placed. And I would like to I mean, share my own, I mean, teaching experience in Gyeonghi University and my own, I mean, prob problematic uh, relationship with the students. Um, I think that should be our, I mean, starting point for uh, elaborating a more theoretical uh, solution to uh, an alternative so-called university system. The first thing that I want to uh, ask you, or I want, uh, I have a curiosity in your own dealing with the current university system is that the grading system, okay? At the end of every semester, we do grade the students. Uh, achievement in each semester, okay? And these days, one of the grading system is so-called relative evaluation system, okay? Uh, at the end of every semester, I do have a struggling how to deal with this so-called, I mean, a grading system, which means that uh, if it is some absolute grading system, I do follow the each student's achievement in my class or in their own, I mean, 
a process of education. But the relative system, I mean, grading system uh, does not require that, but rather cut certain portion of students should be, I mean, uh, and then certain, I mean, already uh, established portion should be allotted to so-called A plus or A. So uh, we all follow that grading system. And the students always, after the class, email me, why should I get this, this sort of a B or C? Uh, and then uh, they ask me to upgrade their, I mean, grade. So, I mean, you are teaching philosophy, uh, if I'm correct then how do you practically deal with uh, this I mean, existing grading system? And are there any, some resisting strategy to, I mean, uh, to deal with this current system? And the second one, uh, I would like to be short, okay? The second one is that, I want to be a teacher, not just a transmitter of the established knowledge. But when I enter my classroom, I do feel some kind of a um, resisting uh, atmosphere in classroom from the students, okay? They think that you have already in an established position, so you might be more radical, okay? You can teach us how to deconstruct the university system and do not use the university as an entering point to the so-called corporate system. But they are eager to enter the system and they are very, very, I mean, uh, fear about not entering the system. So, I mean, uh, if I want to make an experiment of my own classroom as a way of uh, uh, making a truce between my student and myself, and how can, as an established generation of this so-called neoliberal capitalism, uh, can I mean, react to the students' uh, anxiety about not <coughs> entering the system. How, I mean, your response to that student's response? <laughs> I'm very, very curious. I would like to learn <laughs> about some kind of a way to dealing with the students. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's my, <laughs> my actual, Thanks. I mean, dilemma, okay? Yes. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a real dilemma. I'm sure everyone recognizes it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, on the grading thing, obviously, I guess there's a couple of things. I mean, the way that that developed and has developed over time it hasn't always been as, uh, I guess, as complete and as detailed and, and directed as it is. I mean, academics as well as teachers once upon a time had a fair amount of freedom in how they would go about that and as long as they, you know, the kids could pass through whatever levels need to be passed through. There was all sorts of ways of doing that. I guess you could see that sort of grading which has now become, I guess, ubiquitous in the norm and the levels of reporting that that implies is just part of the bureaucracy that comes along with the neoliberalisation of the university. Which again, let me stress, is not, you know, the first time in history that the state has played this role within, you know, the production of knowledge, let's say. So I guess what you're saying there in terms of the grading, and, and you've already, you know, we're already given what used to be the bell curve. I don't know what it runs on now, but so many for this, so many for that, so many for that. And it's your job less to teach and um, assess, if you like, than to place. And place based on rules and place based on a knowledge which must underpin those rules for grading that is not yours to give. After all, 
that is imposed on you structurally by the institution that it must be this way. So you must presume that some knowledge of some sort underpins the decision and the determination to make you, as the expert teacher, act and perform this way. So it is quite, I think it's, you know, that needs to be traced, if you like. What is the knowledge which underpins the determination of this as the way we grade students? And, of course, therefore, for what? <clears throat> which I guess I've sort of tried to point out in some ways. Um, so there's that aspect, I guess. Um, as for that relationship to students, yeah, I, mean, I think what you're identifying is something maybe the person who typed in a question was alluding to that they already arrive at the university, obviously, in some ways, fully formed subjects of education itself. And their demands for grades, you know, correlate to the understanding they've been given of the importance of those things. I don't really think there's many students who would say that the grade they get corresponds to the education they now have. They would, but they certainly understand that the grade they get uh, in some way corresponds or determines the possible future that they may have. And as you said, you know, you appear to them as already someone in a position and they want to attain a position as well. So that sort of uh, um, utilitarian version, it makes perfect sense. And I think everyone who teaches understands the antagonism that you yourself have to deal with between wanting to make it possible for them to, you know, do something in the world which might require that they be educated and graded in this particular fashion and the fact that you're doing it subject to a determination which is not yours and is not situated within your expertise or, or within the expertise of the faculty or the subject itself or the discipline that you're a part of. And again, it's just, you know, what I've, you know, probably spent too much time saying other things, but just to concentrate that antagonism, it sort of appears in all these different guises in everything that we do. And it's not easy to reconcile because we ourselves, you yourself, want to be able to continue to do what you're doing. And clearly, if you step outside that framework in any way, you will suffer the same fate as, you know, the, I guess, the... The, the model for all of this suffers, right? You might not be executed, but you probably lose your job and so on. So, but again, for me, it just comes back to this central antagonism that we're working with. But how do you stop that, overcome that, change that, shift that? Again, it's, a, it's not like there's an easy answer for that, even though there probably is an easy answer, but um, the possibilities for achieving that are just, you know, ones which we need to begin at a certain point, realising realize that an, another orientation is necessary and possible, you know, and begin. And the interesting thing, I guess, about universities and educators in general is that we're supposed to be those who have the knowledge of all of these things and supposedly thereby the capacity to take up these things. But we seem to be absolutely on the back foot or defeated or complicit or whatever it might be, um, globally at this point right but anyway but thanks for that interesting uh elaboration which 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 yes yeah, i think suggests that antagonism again i suppose there's that um strategy i mean one strategy you could adopt is the strategy of slavoj zizek right with the absolute grading system is to award every student who gives in an essay, who hands in an essay an A, and to award every student who does not hand in an essay A+. Plus. Yeah, I but did that once, Jason. You did that once? every student in my class the same mark for a presentation. I gave them 10 out of 10. And when I submitted that, <laughs> there was a bit of comeback and uh, some pressure and so on. And I was forced to go back and to nuance those grades and to justify each one, um, you know, with, with, with some commentary and so on. Uh, so it was a, the, the hilarious thing about it was that the process of giving them their actual grades was absolutely false and made up. Whereas the 10 out of 10 was 
much more accurate representation of what had happened. But there you go. But I know that there has been uh, academics like who have done that sort of thing in in their courses, in their classes, and so on. And maybe whenever maybe they were differently situated, and the pressure or the you know the the the, the logarithm or the algorithm was uh, less pressing. Anyway. Yes, I think we've all we've all been in that kind of situation. I think, yeah. Uh, any any final questions or thoughts? There's no one else online. Uh, so maybe that's a good point at which I should just thank everybody. Thank you very much to all of you here for your patience. Um, there were some technical difficulties at the beginning. I'm really pleased we have managed to overcome most of them, although for people watching on YouTube, uh, Adam's um, image uh, wasn't quite right, but thankfully we could hear him uh, and hear what he had to say. I'm, I'm glad that worked, worked out. Uh, it was fascinating. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, also, Adam, for your patience and um, this really, really powerful intervention. And um, it just remains for me to say, please join us again, if you can. Um, this is just the first week. We're going to be going for months. We'll be exhausted by the end of it and completely disillusioned, I think, with, uh, with the state of the contemporary uh, university. But it's for a reason, I think. Yeah, let's put it like that. It, there's, some, there's some good in this. So thank you. Thank you all very much. And uh, thank you, Adam. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jason, for organising it.